Uh, as you all know, I'm Russ Roberts. I'm the president of Shalem College. My goal in this talk is to give you a way to think about this moment, to understand why it can be so frustrating and hard to talk about it with friends, family, your classmates and campuses. Um, you're going to talk about some of this tonight. This may give you a language for processing it. It, my insights, some are mine, but many of them come from a book by Arnold Klein called The Three Languages of Politics. I recommend it. Uh, I've interviewed Arnold twice on Econ Talk, uh, so you can hear both of those if you're interested. I've written, I don't know, probably three or four essays on the topics I'm going to be talking about today. So if you want to go back and, and, and read my related but older and not as full thoughts, feel free. Okay. Now, Arnold Kling argues that our political discourse, the way we talk about the events of the world around us, is dysfunctional, or at least challenging, because if we look at the world through different lenses. He calls them languages. I, I like the word lens. We use different lenses for interpreting the world around us. And we're going to use, we're going to look at three, but mostly focus on two of them for reasons I think that'll be clear. Oh, the first, never a dull moment. I guess, but it's okay. You want to... yeah. Okay. What's that mean? Nice catch. Um, we start with the left. Progressives, people on the left, they see the world through the following lens. It's a lens actually Arnold wrote about it years ago, but now it's become very common discourse. The left looks uses the lens of the oppressor and the oppressed. The oppressor is the uh, powerful actor, the oppressed is a victim, and events get channeled and seen through that lens. On the right is the conservative, the right winger. The conservative right wing view is the lens that they use is civilization versus barbarism. So and I like the phrase, uh, the veneer of civilization is thin, that it's always at something of a risk. And so for conservatives, they're always worried about preserving civilization and holding off the barbarians. The third lens, I'll stand over here, it's not really in the center, but it's back or different, is the libertarian lens. I used to be more of a libertarian, now I'm something of a conservative, but as I'll argue, I've got some liberal in me, left wing too. Uh, part of the, I would, I would encourage you to think about the goal of life is to use more than one lens. But in this conversation, we're gonna talk about how relentlessly people use only one lens. Not you, of course. You're nuanced, thoughtful, etc. I like to think I'm that way, but in fact, I think most of us often just use one lens. But the libertarian lens is coercion versus freedom. Everything is about the state, the power of the state, coercing people with the threat of, of state-sanctioned violence versus individual liberty. And of course, the left has some of that, the right has some of that, but that's the more libertarian lens. So let's take an example. Let's take the uh, deaths of black Americans at the hands of police. How does the left look at uh, the George Floyd case or others like it? The police are the oppressor. Black people are the oppressed. They're the victims. Uh, it is a incredible injustice. And of course, the liberals are right. Many African Americans have died without good reason at the hands of police. What does the conservatives see? Conservatives see is the law and order is crucial. The police have an impossible job. They don't know who's armed and who's unarmed. A lot of the people that they're dealing with are criminals or would be criminals, and it's crucial to support them. And of course, they're right. Police is an important part of daily life, especially, some would argue, in the most troubled neighborhoods and the worst uh, neighborhoods in America. So the, the right and the left look at that completely different. Differently, libertarians look at it as the state's coercive. There's these horrible drug laws. They were a total failure because of that. The relationship between the police, the attempt to coerce people from taking drugs has led to a dysfunctional relationship between the police and the people they're supposed to protect. So of course things go wrong now and then and people get killed. They're right. The drug laws are our terrible failure. Okay, so each, the weird part, each side sees the same thing. The death of a person that does not deserve to die, and yet 
it is interpreted completely differently. So this is really where intersectionality comes from, right? This is the idea, it, it, there's a much older version of this from uh, Thomas Sowell, one of the great, uh, great books I've ever read in the same flavor in a sense as, as, as claims. I would also add uh, Jonathan Haidt's um, righteous, The Righteous Mind. What Sowell argues is, is that uh, people have uh, a different view of what humanity is capable of. The left sees humanity as perfectible. The right sees us as it is irremediably flawed. And that gives you an answer to every single policy issue. So if I know your view on one issue, I know what you're going to say about everything. Right? I know what your view is on gun control. I know what it is on abortion. I know what it is on police violence. I know what it is on the war in Vietnam. I know what it is on the war in Israel, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, for some of us in this room, that's really challenging because this somehow doesn't feel so comfortable aligning perhaps with some of our other views. And we're, gonna, we're going to explore that. But that's the first insight you get from playing is that, oh, now I understand why people line up and I can predict their views on more than one thing. The second insight of Klang is, and this is deeply comforting potentially, now I can understand why I can't talk to anybody. Why is that idiot can't understand that I'm right, right? Don't you feel that sometimes? I've got all the facts on my side and they have none of the facts, right? They got none of the facts and how come they don't see it the way I see it? It's, not, it's very complicated, but it starts with the problem that we're looking at the world through different lenses. It also suggests why political debate, I'm not interested in debate, I like conversation. I like to understand why you hold your worldview and why you process facts the way you do. I'm not gonna win overnight, you know. Uh, one of my favorite meetings, I, I am a generally free market person and I was at a meeting with people trying to understand why we can't convince people that free markets are great. Economic freedom is great. And somebody said, they got all excited, like a big light bulb went over their head. I know what we need to do. We just need a book that would explain why they're right. I was so disappointed when he came up with that. I was so excited. Mean, the way he built it up, he'd solved it. He said, well, actually, you know, there's about 150 books that make that case. Maybe 151st one would be good because you could say it a different way. Maybe there'd be some people who might see it differently. But that's not the problem. The problem is that they haven't read the book or they haven't heard the arguments. It's a different way of looking at the world. Of course, the, the problem is that we don't respect each other. So not only do we disagree about policy X, whether it's police brutality, the minimum wage, abortion, the war in Gaza, fill in the blank. I don't just think you're wrong. You're wicked, you're evil. You're betraying your country, your people, whatever it is. And you've heard, we've heard these arguments all the time. And here's a, um, in the other part, it's not just that we disagree, it's why we disagree. Because once you realize that we're arguing about two different things, then suddenly I understand why you see the facts differently than I see the facts. Of course, some of the things you think are facts aren't facts. They're literally not true which should raise the possibility in your own mind that that might be true of some of the things you believe, right? Or that, that I believe, right? I don't like that idea. I think, don't you think everything you believe is true? But what if I'm like that person I'm disrespectful of? They're smart and they seem like nice people and they look at me the same way. Well, are we both wrong? We both could be right, but it's possible that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. How do I know it's me, which one it is? And I thought a reader of mine said it very well. This, this is a, uh, it's, it's not a memorable quote. I can't quote it by heart. I can paraphrase, but I'm gonna give you the actual quote. And this is one of the deepest things that I have ever heard. So I say that just to put you in the mood to appreciate it. This is what he says, his name is Sam Thompson. The universe is full of dots. Connect the right ones and you can draw anything. The important question is not whether the dots you picked are really there, but why you chose to ignore all the others. Because that's what we did. Economist I love, Ed Lemer says, 
human beings are pattern-seeking, storytelling animals. So I connect the dots. I have a story to tell you, right? You have your story. We're talk who was it? You asked. Hey, like, I have my narrative. You've got your narrative. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Some of the dots, a few of the dots are the same, but half of the dots in your picture, I don't think they're really there. And half the dots in my picture, you don't think are there. And why did you leave out all the dots that are there that I use to draw my picture? And that is, in some sense, the, na the nature of the human experience. And of course, these lenses, to come back to another point of Khaviv's, these lenses are not just things we use analytically like a tool. Like when I have a hammer, I know what I'm doing with when I'm pounding a nail. But when I'm using this mental model of the left or the right, say, I'm not really aware I'm using the model, right? It's so ingrained in me, I don't realize that I'm swimming in this water. And it becomes part of my identity, it becomes part of the tribe I belong to, right? Our politics, think about all the things that are tribal about us. Our politics, silly things, sports teams, I'm you know, but, but what that jersey is, but we have sport, our, our fellow fans of our sports teams, right? They're our tribe. If you've ever been to a, a serious sporting event, the amount of love and intensity that people feel for strangers is very tribal. There's something deeply embedded in us to connect to other people. And I want to be part of the tribe. So a nuanced person, which I would argue we all should be, but a nuanced person isn't in the tribe because they think the other person has something useful to say. And that's not trouble. That's the other side. What are you doing in our tribe if you think some of what they're saying is right? We deeply, as human beings, want to belong. It's deep embedded in our DNA. And I would say by belong, I mean belong to something bigger than ourselves. So it's our family. It's our religion. It's our nation. It's our set of political beliefs. It's our sports team. These are all the different ways we express tribe. Econ Tech talk guest of mine, Agnes Callard, had a more positive way of, tribal sounds brutal. She called kinship. Does that sound better? I know. We have a kinship over the Boston Red Sox. We have a kinship over the religion or over the fact that we're all here in Israel, or whatever it is. So if we think about how important tribalism is, we really can recognize in ourselves how hard it is to break out of these lenses and silos. But if you can, and once you think of the world the way Arnold Kling does and the way I do too as well, you can actually understand that the person you disagree with is not a bad person. You just don't agree with them. It's a different narrative. And not just a different narrative. They use a different software program <laughs> to write their narrative. And so that's part of the reason they have a different narrative. They don't hate you. They don't dislike you. They don't disagree with you in, over many things. But over this thing, they don't look at the world the same way you do. But because most of us don't spend much time thinking about this, we get outraged. There's a big debate about whether politics are uglier than it used to be. I think they are. I mean, if you go back and you read Thomas Jefferson and, 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 and John Adams in their time, politics was a blood sport. It wasn't a friendly... Uh, Socratic dialogue among people in togas. They cared deeply about outcomes and they lied about their uh, opponents and they made up scandals about them that weren't true. And they took scandals that were true and blew them out of proportion. But it is, I think, at a different level now and I want to try to explain why that is. And the reason, remember, that I don't see what the reason we look at the world differently is that I don't see what you see. And there's three reasons for it. First, we're wearing different glasses. Okay, we got different lenses for trying to decipher what's going on in the world. Second, you see different facts than mine. You pick different dots. But the third is, some of your dots aren't really there, but you don't care. Now, that's a horrible accusation, right? But I realize it's sometimes true for me, right? And so what I wanted to do now, I'm gonna shift gears, and I'm going to try to give you a uh, theory of why the information landscape is so radically different in 2023 than it was 20 years ago. How the Internet has changed things. Some of the ways that changed things are obvious. But this is different, I think. Let's see why. 
basically our ability to access information and curate it for ourselves is radically different and it puts our tribalism on steroids and it ratchets up the outrage at, to a whole new level. So I want you to think of news and information, what we could call facts, evidence, as a buffet, a restaurant, with certain things where you can eat. So you go in the old days, your parents' days, my childhood days, there were three restaurants, ABC, NBC, CBS. You also had, those are the three networks on TV. They also had a thing called PBS, which is public television. But basically there are three channels, three restaurants to choose from. They all have a buffet. Same food at every one of them. Same food. Very bland food. Meat and potatoes. Things that almost everybody likes, but nothing interesting. Why? Because think about how crazy the world is in 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980. How many TVs are in the house? One. How many people live in the house? Let's say three or four. Kids and parents or at least two, usually, parents, what will they watch on the TV? Well, they've got to come to an agreement because everybody has to watch the same thing. They're stuck with it. There's only one TV. So if one of the people is not a sports fan, you can't have a 24-7 sports station. <laughs> it's not, if ABC decides, let's take a chance. Let's go with sports all the time, all, every, all hours. Nobody's going to watch it. Well, a couple will, but you're going to lose an enormous amount of market share. What five TVs in the house does, where everybody has a TV in their own room, is it allows you to have a food channel. And an ESPN channel, you can have more than one food channel. Because you're going to start picking off the peculiar people, the niche people, the people with interesting ideas, interesting tastes. So you can have a Mexican restaurant, you can have a Chinese restaurant, you can have a Jewish restaurant, you can have an Italian restaurant. You go from a world where there's one type of food, because it'd be insane for ABC to be a far left or far right channel, they lose a third or half of their audience. So they're like, I mean, there's a little difference between them. But you suddenly go to a world where you can have more than one channel and then, so cable comes. And cable allows, cable TV allows you to customize what you watch, which is fantastic, by the way. It's great. So finally, I want to see Shakespeare, I can watch Shakespeare. I want to see uh, car wrecks, I can watch car wrecks. I can watch, you know, Roller derby, I can watch anything I want, and then it goes insane because I get not everybody, not only is there a TV in every bedroom of the house, there's a TV in everybody's pocket. And that's called the internet, and that's the smartphone. So what the smartphone allows us to do is curate our feed, our stream of information, to be what we want. And of course, in the early days of the internet, I was one of these naive people. I thought this is going to be just so great. People are going to have so much more information. You're going to be so much smarter. You're going to be so much more knowledgeable. Democracy will thrive, right? Because democracy requires information. It requires people being informed to make good decisions. So if I can curate my own feed and get access to anything I want, I'm going to get smarter. Didn't happen that way. <laughs> so first thing that happens is the news business becomes very challenging. Because all of a sudden, people are putting up these niche, much cheaper, but still people can have access to them, meaning easy to access, cheaper, meaning easy to access, opportunities that people are going to go and taste those. That's where they're going to go to dinner. And you can have chocolate-covered locusts. Because, you know, why not? I've got a website for that. And you can go there, and it's great. So NBC loses all the people who love chocolate-covered locusts, right? Chocolate-covered grasshoppers. Those folks are all going to the food channel that specializes in the Iron Chef for chocolate-covered grasshoppers, right? That's an amazing, and if, if that's your thing, it's fantastic, right? College Cross, I'm in, I'm on that channel. Wow, it's awesome. Every, every day, it just pin as an hour on College Cross. So these people start getting picked off, and the mainstream organizations that can't respond go out of business. But one thing's obvious. As hard as it is to figure out what's going on, the only way literally that you survive is by catering to what the customer wants, which usually is a great thing. And even though I'm a pretty much free market guy, I'm going to show you that catering to what the customer wants in this case is awful. Okay? We'll see why. Because when you have, this is not obvious. So you've got your buffet set up. If you're going to survive, you've got to change what to serve. Because you're going to get eaten a lot, right? 
That's not obvious, but it's really important because once you realize the new landscape, your competitors are not who you think they are. So people think that's, who do they, normally people would say, what's CNN's competitor? Who's their competitor? Fox News. Competitor's MSNBC. It's another station that, another network that leans left and everyone on the internet that's left of that, right? Fox News competitor isn't CNN because nobody on CNN wants to watch. You know, my mom watches Fox News. Are we recording this? Oh, dear. <laughs> my mom watches Fox News maybe 12 hours a day. <laughs> you know, I don't, I say, mom, you know, you might, she'd say, do you know what the such and such is happening? I said, I'm not sure that's true. And she'd say, but I saw it on the news. I said, well, you know, I think if you saw that on CNN, I think they probably covered it differently. But she never goes, oh, I guess I'll watch CNN then. Right? Think about that. Why doesn't she ever watch CNN? And similarly, people who watch CNN, it wasn't my mom, just an older person <laughs> living in Alabama who's 91 years old. Okay. Somebody who watches CNN, you say, you know, you get a different perspective if you watch Fox News. What's their answer? Fox News is disgusting. Why would you watch a bunch of lies? Right? So there's no, the natural people that you think, we think, compete with each other aren't the competition. And your real danger, if you're Fox News, is not the people on the left, because they don't, they're not your, they're not coming to that, your restaurant, ever. Your competition are the people to your right who have food that people in your group do like, and they're angrier and louder, that other station, so you're going to lose customers to them. And that's really scary. So, you know, in my youth, meaning 20 years ago, People in the news pretended they were objective. They don't pretend anymore. They're not objective. The New York Times is not objective. Fox News is not objective. Right? They have an ax to grind. You know why? It's not because they're all of a certain flavor. They are. But that's a choice. They don't want diversity in their news coverage. They want to make sure they keep their customers who will keep them in business. There's a lot of romance about news. Viv's a journalist. You can talk to him about it sometime, maybe. They think they're truth seekers. They can't afford to be anymore. It's a tragedy. It's a reality. They're not after the truth. They're after customers. Because if they, and they can rationalize it a thousand ways. But of course, because if they don't, they won't exist. It doesn't matter how much truth you're interested in finding. If no one's going to read it, what's the point? And of course, after a while, you do hire people who are like your customers. It's really important. You know, the, the, the joke is, not a joke, it's a quote from the earliest part of the 20th century. The job of the journalist is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Can't afford to do that anymore. They don't do it. It's not what they do. They're trying to stay in business. So what sells is, here's the hard part to admit, it's really no fun, but let me say a few more things about it. We'll talk about what sells. Now, think about yourself. What do you want to watch? What grabs your attention when it comes to news and politics? Who do you follow on Twitter? Econ what? Econ talk. Econ talk, of course. But Twitter, not a, not a social media uh, uh, feed. But if you go to social media, you go to Twitter or TikTok or Instagram, what grabs your attention? Most people like to read things that make them a cruel thing to say, feel good about themselves. And what do they want to read about the other side? How horrible they are, that they're foolish, stupid, evil, dangerous, etc. Now, here's my question for you to think about. Of all the things you've consumed on Twitter, how many people here are on Twitter in a fairly active way? Raise your hand. Not too many. Uh, Instagram, raise your hand. TikTok, raise your hand. Facebook, you. Uh, did I miss any? An important one? What is it? <laughs> Telegram. LinkedIn. Or as my dad, rest his soul, used to call it. He said, are you on this thing, LinkedIn? <laughs> what is that, LinkedIn? I don't know, I've never heard of it. Oh, LinkedIn. Oh, yeah, yeah, dad, that is a, th that is a thing. He also, he liked to call it Nosebook, which I, I kind of like that. Um, <laughs> But here's my question. When you're on any of your social media sources, 
How many stories have you read that turned that you loved, that you shared with 12 other people that made you feel good that day? How many were wrong? We have no idea because <laughs> you don't spend a lot of time trying to find out. Of what? Is wrong? Oh, I think it's a lot higher than that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, the, 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 here's why I, would, why I say that. I don't know if you know this. How many psych majors do we have here? Okay, a few. You know, there's a thing. How many of you know about the replication crisis? Raise your hand. None of the psych majors. Well, no, one of the psych majors. So the, the replication crisis is that a lot of people started to wonder whether the claims of some of the most famous papers in psychology were true. And how would you figure that out? Well, you try to replicate them in science. You go out and you redo the study. My favorite being the one, this, this is a true story. This is hard to believe, but it's a true story. They took a group of people and they used words like Florida and bald and cane, things associated with senior citizens. The people in the room thought it was something else. They didn't know that this was the underlying thing. They were answering some aptitude exam, but in the course of their aptitude exam, they got words that were related to older people. And this group, the control group, didn't get those questions, okay? And then they timed the people to see how quickly they move. I'm laughing because this never passed the sniff test for me, but you know, some things that don't pass the sniff test turn out to be true, but this is not one of them. They timed the people leaving the room and they found that the people who got the older terms left the room slower because they were thinking about being elderly. <laughs> and the other people left faster because they didn't get those words. That in psychology is called priming. So priming was proved in many, many studies. But when people went to check the studies, meaning okay, you did this with 30 undergraduates, let's do it with 300 undergraduates. And let's do it where I run the stopwatch, not the person who wants to publish paper and maybe is a little slow subconsciously, not, not broad, but it's maybe a little slow getting off the gun. And it didn't hold up, couldn't be replicated. The person who wrote as a famous psychologist, the, the original paper explained, oh, they didn't do it right. It's just, not, it's just not true. It doesn't mean there aren't things related to priming that could be true, but not that one, okay? Having, hearing words that you associate with older uh, things don't make you walk more slowly. Um, you'll watch now, the second half of this lecture, now that I've used the older words, we'll see if my pacing slows down, but you then have to control, you have to have a second lecture where I gave it, because maybe I'm just tired by the second half of the lecture to control for that, we do one where I wouldn't use the word Florida and cane and uh, arthritis. Okay. But when they went to try to replicate these results, and, and I interviewed the, for Econ Talk, I interviewed the uh, psychologist, Brian Nozick, who started this movement. It's an amazing, amazing thing. A frightening number, more than 25%, did not replicate. So many of the, the findings of the statistical findings of psychology and now other fields as well, are not reliable. They're reliable at a very low, surprisingly low level. I don't remember the exact actual number. Rip. The paper came out with both MRI data and analyzed it in 12 different ways. They got 11 different ways. That's it. Yeah, there are others like that. Uh, the way that Brian Nozick summarized it with his co-authors, which I love, uh, published and true are not synonyms. We think they are. Studies show, fill in the blank. Most of them, maybe they show. There's studies on the other side that show something else. Okay, why did I bring this up? Oh, because I asked how many stories have you read that aren't true, and Rupka says 25%. If I had said, if she had said 25.7%, you would have thought, oh, 25%. Science, got a decimal point. 25. <laughs> It'd be even better 27.7 because 25 sounds like some, but 27.7 sounds like a rigorous thing was done. But the point is that half the things that you love, you shared with your brother or your cousin or your mom, they're not true. Some of them are, but you'd have no idea which ones are true and aren't true. 
have some feel. If I pressed you, you might say, hmm, I'm not sure that one's true. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, right? And you still might send it along, but in general, we don't worry about that. Um, I want to make an analogy. It sounds horrible, but I actually think it's quite accurate. And I haven't lived in the United States for two years, two and a half years. One of the great things about moving here, uh, it's one of the worst things at first, but then it becomes one of the best things. There's no point in going to internet websites to shop because the mail here doesn't work very well. I mean, there is a little window for Amazon here if it's between 57 and $69. If it goes over $69, it's, it falls under customs and you're in trouble. So occasionally I buy something on Amazon, but the number of hours I spend like scrolling through Amazon webpage and I'm like, I could use that. Can I, I can have it tomorrow? That'd be great. I'll try it. I don't, I don't do that here at all. It's not worth it. And it's great. It's liberating. So I don't know. I think Zappos still exists, evidently. Shoe, the shoe website. So think about what an amazing thing Zappos is, right? Again, when I was in America, I used it all the time. 50,000 plus pairs. Of, I don't know how many. I tried to find it before this talk, how many pairs of shoes they carry. It's, when I wrote the version of this a couple years ago, it was 50,000. Maybe it's more. Maybe it's less. But thousands of shoes, okay? You send them back free returns. Of course, nothing's free. It's embedded in the price. I'm an economist. It's embedded in the original price, the cost of the return. But still, it's pretty amazing. It's cheap. Amazing choices. Now, when I shop for shoes, let's talk about what we care about. So I want them to fit, and I want them to be comfortable. What's the third thing I care about? What? Price? Well, one other thing. Style. What kind of style? When I say style, like I'm wearing these. See these down here? These are Samuel Hubbard's. Kind of stylish for a certain audience, but not embarrassing, right? Not embarrassing. Not embarrassing shoe. So I want that. I want to be embarrassed. And if I'm a serious shoe person, and we may have some here, almost certainly have some here, uh, you want it to be kind of like, cool. and it's kind of fun. It was nothing to do with the talk, but I always like it. How many people here own more than 20 pairs of shoes? Raise your hand. They're all lying. Well, yeah, they're all lying. Yeah. Yeah. But a number, a number own more than 20. I used to do this in, you know, there are people in the world who have one pair of shoes. Most of human history, you didn't have any shoes. Then you got one pair and you're really excited, even though they didn't fit very well. Now, most of us, the shoes are just something we do. We want, we tailor them to our outfit. We tailor them to the color we want. It's really wonderful. So fit, comfort, and style. And Zappos just makes it really easy. It's really fun. I want to suggest that the way we consume news is the way we consume shoes. Fit, comfort, and style. I want news that fits my preconceived notions. I want to consume news that makes me comfortable. And I want, this is the most important, I want to consume news that my friends and people around me respect and think are cool. Now, when the shoes I buy don't fit, I return them. What do I do with the views that I hold, the news that I consume that isn't accurate? Nothing. Most of the time, Rivkin, you can what? Well, you can change whether you call them terrorists or freedom fighters, for sure. But I can pick which one I want. I can find the new source that, that fits, that, that takes care of that. How much is, like, the not being able to return things you see, do you think, has to do with an inability to, like, unsee something? And how much of it do you think is a conscious, even if we could unsee, we wouldn't? My personal belief not scientific, like most of the things that I believe or that anyone believes. I think it's really hard to consume information that gets at your deepest self. Okay? Very hard. Very hard to accept it. Very hard to consume it. I'm sympathetic being a Jew, living in Israel. I tend to be more, I'll talk more about this in a minute, more sympathetic with the Israeli side of this current fight than with the Palestinian side, okay? So in my Twitter feed, sometimes the Twitter algorithm messes up and sends me something that makes me uncomfortable. Now I can choose, in Twitter you can choose following and for you. Following means I totally curate it. For you means I let their algorithm send me stuff that I didn't 
choose to follow. And darn it, every once in a while, they send me some anti-IDF stuff. I just, <laughs> look at that, I'm gonna ruin my day. I like to hold the moral high ground, I don't know about you. It's a whole separate issue related to what Javi was talking about, I think. Why do we care so much that we have a moral high ground over the other side? Not just on this issue, on every issue. Minimum wage, abortion, minority rights. Yeah, Jimmy. Right, like intuition or things that are, that are more knowledge or not sort of rational, fully understandable. Maybe can be traced to other things. But suppose those, those things that aren't like that are true. Should you just grab them when you can? Yeah. Kind of hard to do. A friend of mine, economist, is graduate school, and he's on a picnic with a bunch of friends. He doesn't believe the minimum wage is a good thing. Okay, So it comes up, the topic. And he says, well, I don't know. He's the economist of the group. And I think minimum wage makes, doesn't it make low-skilled workers more expensive? And doesn't that make it less likely and attractive to employers? And so might the minimum wage actually hurt the people it's trying to help? I said, what did they say? He said, they edged away from me on the blanket. They didn't go, one more. Uh, I won't give you the one more. I, I've, I've been in that conversation 50 times about 50 different things when they edge away from me from the, well, here's a better one. Uh, uh, I said something positive about Walmart at a, at a lunch once with someone who was saying how evil they were. And, and I said something like, well, I don't know, they seem to give a lot of employment opportunities to low skilled workers that can rise up to the ranks and, and then they have lower prices for poor people. And like, if you really cared about poor people, which she does, I know she does, wouldn't you think her reaction would be, and if she was a truth seeker, but what should her reaction be? Wow, I never thought of that. And you're an economist, so maybe my whole worldview, my whole life has been wrong. No, she stood up and said, literally, I don't have to listen to this. I'm thinking, well, what, to what? <laughs> what, to, to the truth? Now, the truth was, to be fair to her, I said in a provo more provocative, less thoughtful way probably than I just shared it with you, and I did have a a motive, it's not nice, but I was trying to provoke her and make her think, right? But I think her reaction is most people's reaction, which is you challenge a deeply held view of mine that is the key part of my identity. I don't ever say, well, that's interesting. Maybe I should put on a different set of clothing in my identity. I say, and eh, 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 run away, run away. I don't have to listen to this. That's the way most of the things we do, you know, whether it's on, especially on religion, right? If you're religious and someone has a proof about the Bible, say, that, that shows that it's clearly not written by God, you don't want to hear, you don't want to go like, well, I'd like to hear that because, of course, I know that the Bible's true. I might say that, but I'd be very uncomfortable with that. And similarly, if you're not a religious person, and someone brings you something that is persuasive, possibly, about the existence of the divine or something outside of normal material existence, you know, go, wow, well, you know, maybe my, my whole life's been a lie. But I was going to say is that, I learned this from Adam Mastriani, a really great psychologist. I've interviewed him three times. He's really phenomenal. You know, he says there's certain things in our keep. The keep is the part of the castle that where the that is about survival. You keep the most precious things in the keep. That's why they're called keep prop. And what's in there is so heavily guarded that it, it's very hard to get in there, right? You don't let an interesting fact that might be inconsistent with one of your deeply held views jar your life beliefs. Because if it did, you would have nothing ever, not just this time, if every interesting, provocative fact that came along, you went, well, maybe I'm wrong my whole life. You have no light, right? The things that we hold to our core, whether it's our Judaism, our Americanness, our atheism, our uh, Christianity, our 
Boston Red Sox, they were a great team. They never cheated, ever. Now, the Patriots, okay, they had a deflate gate thing. But I thought there was an answer to that, and everybody missed the point. Right? We have stories to tell ourselves, because if we couldn't tell ourselves those stories, we wouldn't have anything to hold on to. So his argument is that evolutionarily, the keep has to be kept remarkably secure. Now, people lose their faith. People gain, become converts. People join new religions. People become Balchuva. So it's not like it never, ever happens, but we all understand how hard those things are. And just in case I don't get to say it, I walked in on a conversation out here and I heard a half a phrase, which was what? Yeah, I, I just sort of thought that after that, it would just be, and I said, well, that's what we're going to talk about. Because I did too. I thought after October 7th, Everybody's going to say, oh, the Jews were right, and the Israelis were right all along about Hamas. Now, there were some people who did, and some people did change their minds, but most people didn't at all. Not just now at all. They doubled down, tripled down, quadrupled down. We'll talk about it. You know, so my claim is people don't really care much about the truth. It's on the list, but it comes way down after fit, comfort, and style because the return to truth isn't high enough, speaking like an economist. What does truth do for you? Now, if you're talking about eating poison, it's really good to know the truth. But if you're talking about who's right, the right candidate to vote for, it doesn't do much for you except alienate you from your friends, <laughs> right? Think about that. If it really is true that fill in the blank, Biden, Trump, just for now, horrible, but that might be who we have to choose from. If you really thought that Biden or Trump was the best candidate for America, and you you and all your friends think otherwise, what's the return to, to changing who you say you like? What does it do? It just loses you your friends. And guess what? You change how many votes from that process? How many? One. Ever been a tie? Even at the electoral level? No. So it totally doesn't matter. So your incentive, other than your cultural heritage, to be a truth seeker is not embedded in your self-interest. Yeah. Um, so are you saying that um, the truth is not useful because it doesn't provide material gain? And there's a it doesn't buy any kind of gain. I, what I'm saying is, what I'm really saying is you can't handle the truth. I'm really saying that the truth, that it's, I'll, I'll say it a little more subtly. I'm kind of just being provocative right at that last minute and a half. Truth is elusive, very elusive. So when I see something on the internet and I go, wow, that's great, I'm gonna send that to my brother, he's gonna love that. Then I think, I wonder if it's true, oh, who cares, right? But let's say I do care. And I wanna to try to find out if it is true. You know how much time you have to spend on it? Take any of the debates, the big political debates of the last X years, or take Vivek Ramaswamy. You ever see anything he says? Some people have seen him make claims. He's an interesting guy, incredibly articulate. I have no idea what it's all about. Can't quite get his game. He'll make some outrageous claim about January 6th. And you go, oh, that's ridiculous. Then he, but how do I know it is? Well, look, dig into it. And you start see something he said, well, that is true, actually, that thing he said. And I thought it wasn't true. But it would take days, certainly hours, to verify every outrageous claim that he or Robert Kennedy makes, right? You can't do that. So what do you do? You rely on experts, people you trust, credible sources. In the old days, what did you rely on? The network. If Walter Cronkite said it, or Dan Rather, or Sam Donaldson, all people before your time, but they were the face of, of news in America, you say, well, he would never lie to me. Of course he did, all the time. Not on purpose necessarily, but sometimes on purpose, right? So the bottom line is, it's not, I don't mean to say you don't, I don't want to go around and say untrue things. I don't want to share untrue social media posts, but I don't know if they're true. And if they confirm my bias or antagonize the other team, I kind of, a lot of people sign around because they get a kick out of them. Yeah. Do you buy, like people are very into betting markets as a solution. Betting markets, yeah. To what extent? I thought you said bed and markets. And I thought, interesting. Bed, bed and yeah, like, like bed and breakfast. No, okay. No, bed and mark betting markets, yeah. As a, as a solution because it forces you to be right. Put some skin in the game. Yeah. Right. All right. So betting markets are one way to try to, to 
impose a cost on yourself for saying stupid things or believing stupid things. But I'm trying to say something deeper, which is that we really, they're interesting. And I think somewhat maybe kind of, I'm interested in whether they can help us bring out truth. I think most people don't care about these kinds of, I do care if my car is gonna explode, right? If I buy a car and, and a lot of them explode and I see on the internet, oh, these cars, a lot of them explode, that I'm gonna look into. And if I think it's true, I'm not gonna buy the car because it would explode and it would be bad for me. But voting stupidly is not caught. By the way, this kind of ties into your democracy discussion I heard you had the other day about who should vote and who shouldn't vote. This should, this should really make you uncomfortable, uh, but we'll leave that for a gender discussion, yeah. Are you saying that in order to find the truth or at least kind of get the best version of the truth that we can, we should strive for secrecy? No, <laughs> God forbid. No, no. What I'm saying is, if 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 because that's not the truth. Do you say centrism? Yeah, like if if there's these three lenses that we're looking through and there's validity or virtue to all three of them, then shouldn't we be trying to look through all three of them in different? Okay, so that's what you meant. Sort of in the middle and be like, okay, okay, I see where you're coming from over here. Okay, when we get to the end, which is about five or 10 minutes from now, you can have the first question. And I'm going to try to answer because it's a very good question. Like, what's the, if I'm right and you don't like who you are, you've looked into your own soul and go and saw yourself in my description and you realize that's not who I want to be. I want a different identity. What do you do? And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but I'm going to say one other thing. Um, no, wait. Yeah. In, in, in ideology and politics, not in car purchases, right? If, if, if food makes you nauseous, like I can't eat a tomato, a raw tomato. I want to, but I can't. It's a big handicap in life. So, but that's a truth. And if I ignore it, if I order the, the, the uh, tomatoes drizzled with, uh, you know, uh, olive oil and whatever, what's the other thing we drizzle them with? It's balsamic vinegar, thank you. I'm not gonna like it. I mean, I'm gonna find out very quickly I made a mistake. If you vote for the wrong candidate, you never find out. Like, yeah. This is going to be a double question. Okay. I mean, not personal. You don't really believe it, probably. Yeah. Just okay. So, can it be argued that if you adopt the view that goes against what most of your community or friends believe, so you'll be disenfranchised. Correct. And then you'll be lonely. And I don't know if these studies have been replicated because apparently mine studies aren't, but studies show that um, disenfranchisement or rather that having a community right. is kind of toxic. Okay. Yeah, I've heard that too. It's not, I'm sure it's not true, but I'm also sure that not feeling marginalized and not belonging is very hard on the human being. I'm not sure it's, quote, the same as smoking, but it doesn't matter. It's not good for you. So we all react to that. We understand that. I mean, there's a, there's a wonderful book, which I'll recommend, called Tribe. It's by Sebastian Junger. I also interviewed him on Econ Talk. You can listen to it if you want. He claims, and I, it could be true, I think it's probably, and it's verifiable more or less, that Indians kidnapped people in the early days of, of America and took them as hostages or slaves and took them into Indian communities. And then a couple of years would go by and they'd get rescued, right? Or six months would go by. And guess what? A lot of them didn't want to go back. Why? Because once they became part of this unbelievable you know, again, this is the flip side of the Khabib Redigur. I thought that was maybe a little too strong, but provocative claim about America being the loneliest, you know, place in the world. If, if, you, if you're an Indian, a, North, a Native American, or if you're an Orthodox Jew, or if you're Amish, you get something wonderful in return for the restrictions. And everybody appreciates that. You belong. It is a powerful, uh, intoxicating feeling. So yes, that's part of what I'm suggesting is why we don't really want to play with our beliefs. So very much. Yeah. But again, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I think it, it would be absurd to say to try to examine everything that comes across your your social media feed. Oh, that might not be true. That could be true. If we're going to come back to that question. It's like, do I just go well? Anything you know? Second question is, what do you? If I'm right, if this is true, that this, there's a certain toxic steroidal ratcheting up of my tribal sensibilities, because I can curate my own news feed on social media, should we be worried about that? And that's, that's a relevant question. And what Twitter has found one solution, it's not a solution, but it might, might help, 
Okay. So this brings us to um, this moment, to Israel in this war. Broadly speaking, it has played out exactly like Arnold Kling says. Some people believe, what is, how, do we, how should we view this war? Oppressor versus oppressed. Israel's the oppressor, Palestinians are oppressed. Everything about October 7th is okay. I left out one side, where'd it go? Oh, it's come. Um, what does the conservative say? This is about civilization, civilization versus barbarism. And th these are savage barbarians on October 7th. Did the most inhuman, despicable, that I don't even like to use the words because I try to be... I try to be... I try to be sympathetic to people who disagree with me. People call them monsters, animals. I don't like that. I don't, I don't think it's productive. I don't think it's helpful. But they did unimaginably horrific things that I don't know if you've started to appreciate it. Just when you came in in the airport and you walked into the airport and saw the, the, the uh, posters for the kidnap. If you go to Tel Aviv, it's even stronger. You start seeing it around here as you walk around. It's still October 7th here. We're not over it. You know, my, my, I don't know if this is accurate. I think it is. You know, in America, you have a school shooting. It is a horrible, insanely depressing, grotesque tragedy. And how long, you know, it's in Newtown, Connecticut. Newtown in Connecticut? Okay, so it's in Newtown, Connecticut. If you think about it rationally, you know that Newtown, Connecticut, hundreds of lives there are ruined forever. It's very sad, incredibly sad. How much time do you devote to thinking about that sadness? How long? Wow, that's a lot. Most people, it's an hour or a minute and a half. Wow, that's terrible. Turn the page, right? It's the way it is. It's a big country. It's a big country. And if it was your cousin, you'd feel very differently about it. Here, everybody's your cousin. This is like a family. It is the strangest place. I can only tell you this. I'm not an Israeli. I'm not Khabib Gore. I didn't grow up here. But the feeling here of how a soldier dying, American soldiers die all the time, right? We've been in all kinds of wars over my lifetime. Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq. It doesn't even make the pay, it doesn't even make the paper when a soldier dies in America. Unless it's, you know, a former NFL football player, which happened, who enlisted into the war in Iraq and died. Here every day it's on the front page. Everybody's sad about it, by the way. And when they go, think about how strange this is. When a, when a lone soldier, somebody here without a family, did I talk about this on the first talk? Yeah, I talked about it. And when a lone soldier dies, there's 500 people at the funeral. They don't know him, but they do. One of us. That, that feeling, one of us, is profound here. It's extremely powerful. But October 7th is still with us. The hostages haven't come back. We're still identifying bodies in the South with DNA that because they were damaged beyond recognition. We have to use DNA. It is, it's awful. So that's a quintessential civilization versus barbarism. And conservatives, if that's your natural tendency, have no problem figuring out who's, which side is on, they're on. But these two sides can't communicate. They struggle to communicate. And my favorite example, there's a video you can see it on social media. Oakland, California had a hearing about whether to advocate for a ceasefire. A weird thing, right? What does that even mean? But they did. It was six hours. Person after person came up. I'm sure some of them said thoughtful things. But, of course, the video only captured the stranger things that they said. It was not a representative sample, part of what we're talking about. Some people said, a lot of them said, October 7th did not happen. It is, literally didn't happen. Uh, some people said it did happen, but it was done by the IDF, by the Israeli army. You heard that one? Very, I think they did probably kill one person, three. I don't know how many, but that did happen. There was friendly fire death on October 7th, I think. Again, that's one of those examples, but how many? Uh, how, how long would it take me to figure that out? I could probably find it. I could find out maybe the Israeli army had a press release. Uh... So it didn't happen. It did happen, but Israel did it. It happened. Israel didn't do it. Hamas did it, but they were justified because they live in an open-air prison, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Their world that they're living in, 
They're in an alternative universe, partly because of the lens they're using, but because of that lens, the facts that they're consuming are not the same as my facts. If I thought what they thought was true was true, I feel exactly the same way they would, right? And again, I feel the same way, I could even hinted at it, but I feel the same way about the Palestinians. If I were Palestinian, oh no, I'd understand that it's really, it's their fault. I wouldn't, I feel like they are. And if someone said you have a chance to go do damage to Israel, maybe I would do it. I mean, it wouldn't be me. That's the challenge, by the way. I have an essay on the three blind spots of politics, right? Liberals, people on the left, look at, at poor people and think they're just victims. They have no agency. Everything's the fault of the oppressor. The conservatives think, I just pulled myself up by the bootstraps. Why don't they work hard? They can find a job. America's an amazing place. Anybody can find a job. Why can't they? Well, I don't know. If you, if you grew up without a parent in a crime-ridden neighborhood and uh, got no education, maybe you'd have trouble finding a job. And maybe you wouldn't be as motivated as you are growing up in, in suburbia with your two parents like you did. I mean, it's a, it's a, it, it, but every side has trouble understanding the reality, but they consume fact after fact after fact that confirms their worldview. Okay. Again, think about this. Both sides think they're on the moral high ground. It's the strangest thing. They don't think they're wrong or not as right as you. They think you're wrong and they're right. And that should give you pause, right? That, that's thought provoking. I mean, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'll say it briefly. It was at dinner uh, six weeks ago, and then fairly soon after October 7th, and a, a woman was telling me that her Palestinian friend, a woman she had worked with for decades, 20 years, they can't talk, they, they don't talk anymore. Why? She said, I don't know. We just don't talk anymore. We can't. Not that they got into a fight, right? He, he is sympathetic to the Palestinians and maybe even to October 7th. Glory to our martyrs, they said. She made Aliyah. That was pretty predictable, wouldn't it? Wasn't that, you know? <laughs> is that, is, that should give you pause. That should make you think. That you can predict what a person's going to do without having any information about them other than one's Israeli and one's Palestinian. I mean, that tells you how hard it is to shatter or reconsider your worldview. And of course, having said that, there are people who changed their lenses on October 8th. They did. And I'll come to that in a second. Okay. Let me, uh, let me summarize with a few lessons, some related to questions we've had. And then we can, I'll open it up to general questions. Okay. We're talking about the war. Pick any issue. You and I, again, it could be whether the, who's the greatest baseball player of all time. It could be something really unimportant or what's the greatest pizza or et cetera. It doesn't have to be something actually controversial and life where there's a real stake in it. But often I'm gonna have my own reality, you're gonna have yours because we've chosen to listen and absorb different facts. We both feel we're right, but that doesn't mean that we're both right. And it doesn't mean that we're both wrong. Um, it doesn't mean that there isn't a truth. There's a temptation to listen to this and say, well, who knows? I can't have any strong opinions because the truth's elusive and everybody's got their own narrative. I don't think that's true. I don't like that. I don't want to believe it. And I don't think, I think you should live your life in a different way. I think you should live your life believing that there is truth and it's hard to find and you have to work at it. And sometimes you may not be able to know what it is, but you should not assume, well, mine's just the product of my Jewish upbringing and my biases. So therefore I might be as wrong as the other side. I don't, I don't want to live that way. You can't, it's, it's, not, it's not human. Two, people do change. Like I said, a lot of people, I think, especially Jews, confronted by October 7th, had to feel differently than they felt on October 6th. Uh, they've started to realize that maybe there is more barbarism in the world than, I mean, the tragedy of south of Gaza, the unbearable tragedy on top of everything else, is that many of the people who chose to live there were working and living there because they wanted to build bridges between themselves and the Palestinian people. They were people who took Palestinians to Israeli hospitals, who worked in social activism, 
to connect the two populations, unbearable. Some of those people have had a wake up call, some haven't, doesn't, not, and, and that, that's okay too, but a lot of people have changed. Uh, three, and this is I think one of the most important things, you can use two lenses at the same time. And Khabib has I think hinted at it a number of times this, this, this afternoon. I think what happened on October 7th was the most barbaric attack in, in, in modern, in my lifetime, and, and the cruelty of it and the joy they took in it and the willingness to broadcast it, and it has done deep damage, which was their goal, to the people who live here, not just who had to live through it, whose loved ones were killed, but also the rest of us. It, it, it was a horrific thing. That doesn't change the fact that I think it's really hard to grow up in Gaza, you know? It's a hard life there. Israel bears some responsibility for that. How much is an interesting question, but I think you can say that and, and be honest about it. So um, I'll say it a different way. Four, uh, a lot of people say in this conflict, you have to pick a side. I'd say you have to pick a lens. Uh, partly because I'm Jewish, as I said, I live in Israel. I while I sympathize with Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, and I ache over civilian deaths, I don't want any, I wish, although I don't wanna not prosecute the war. I've chosen the civilization versus barbarism for my lens to, to look at this, but I have a leftist side. I can still acknowledge this Palestinian suffering and I can still acknowledge Israeli mistakes, right? <laughs> I mean, it's an unbelievable thing, horrible. The big, one of the biggest tragedies of this war so far, I hope it's the worst, is we killed three hostages trying to come to safety, we meaning the IDF. Now, I, I take great pride, perhaps stupidly, because I'm an American, I'll take Khalid's framework. I take great pride in the fact that we admitted it immediately. Do you remember that? We said, this was a horrible mistake. It's not our practice. We're, and we'll investigate it. We do. We investigate all these things. I don't believe that it's the whole thing was made up. I don't believe the Israeli government decided to pretend that they did that. They made a terrible mistake. Admit it. There's nothing, you don't have to always defend your side all the time. You can say, we do bad things sometimes. Then you can say, but, we're, but, but we wish we didn't. And we have investigations. And you can still take the moral high ground if you want, if that's important to you. But I think there's nothing wrong with admitting we make some terrible strategic mistakes, human mistakes, cruelties. We're, we're flawed. It's okay. Five. It is tempting to say that those on the other side are not bad people. They just see the world differently from the way I see it. Now, that's the way I see most things. People who disagree with me politically in America, I tried not to hate them. I tried to understand why they felt the way they did. I tried to understand what facts they saw that I didn't see. I think it's a lovely attitude. And I encourage you to cultivate that attitude, cultivate respect for people. But some of the people on the other side are bad people. Uh, you can say each of us is entitled to our own narratives and never the twain sh shall meet, but that's the road to moral nihil nihilism also. And worst of all, some of the people on the other side, right or wrong, want to kill me. So I best beware and take them at their word. Happy to be open-minded about their narrative, but not at the cost of my life, my children's lives, or the lives of my neighbors and friends. So, you know, that, that's the, uh, I think the reality I've always loved this poem by Hiller Belloc. Pale Ebenezer thought it wrong to fight, but Roaring Bill who killed him thought it right. So if you're facing Roaring Bill and you don't want to die, you got to fight. Uh, but and it's fun to believe we have a moral cause, but whether we have a moral cause or not, we certainly have a personal cause. I do, certainly. Your choice as Americans to be part of that or not. It doesn't mean you, you disbelieve everything uh, the other side says. It doesn't believe it doesn't mean that everything our side does is true and uh, the world's a complicated place. So what I find comforting about this uh, framework I've tried to share with you is it helps me feel better about the insanity of the world. It gives me a way to process it that uh, otherwise I couldn't do.